द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ वॉइस अ ब्लैक मैन टॉकिंग अबाउट हीज हिस्ट्री ही इज क्लेमिंग बैक हिज आइडेंटिटी और हीज क्लेमिंग बैक हिज राइट टू टॉक अबाउट हिमसेल्फ Hello and welcome back to Nibble Pop. Today in this video we are going to look at a poem called The Negro Speaks of Rivers. It is by Langston Hughes and this poem is part of your American literature syllabus. We will first look at some of the important facts about Langston Hughes then go on to a very close reading of the text and its analysis. We will discuss the themes, the symbols the form and structure of the poem at the end so don't skip any part of this poem because you are going to need all this information to form your answers both for long and short questions and if you like this video do consider subscribing to us to stay connected this is monami mukherjee welcome once again Langston Hughes was born in 1901 although he himself uh, writes in his autobiography that he was born in 1902 uh, but he was born when this previous century was just starting he was a key figure in the Harlem Renaissance of America we will come to this word Harlem Renaissance and what it is about a bit later first learn a little bit about Langston Hughes He was a writer of short stories, poetry, essays and all sorts of writings and in his writings he mostly talked about uh, the sufferings, the joys, the problems, the experiences of black Americans who we also call African Americans. Interestingly, he had a mixed racial ancestry uh, from his father's side as well as his mother's side. both his great grandmothers they belonged to the slave community they were slave women while both his great grandfathers uh, they were slave traders now all of you already know about this uh, concept of slave trading this was more like uh, a practice which uh, became very popular with the growth of colonialism although this idea of slaves and trading of slaves uh, this this is very ancient uh, and it it went on uh, back even during the times of ancient civilizations human beings were trafficked they were sold and although uh, legally this is abolished now we do find instances of trafficking human trafficking um, especially uh, girls all right so this idea of human body as a commodity uh, this is a very uh, derogatory one and it attacks the dignity of human life and therefore the emancipation of slaves that happened in america during the 19th century under abraham lincoln that was a very important moment in the history of human civilization but poems like these Uh, bring out the real implication of that moment whether that freedom was actually achieved uh, what was the after effect okay so the writings of black americans uh, after the emancipation movement after the emancipation act came about that whole body of literature is very important to make us understand the real implementation of that emancipation act or that anti slavery act on a personal level langston hughes had a complicated relationship with his father uh, his parents got divorced uh, like soon after he was born his father uh, could not cope with Uh, the kind of racial discriminations going around and didn't want to stay in this place and he went away abandoning his family uh, although he uh, did uh, offer to uh, sponsor uh, Hughes education if he studied engineering which he did not want to do he wanted to be a writer 
So by the time he was 12, he had lived in like six different American uh, cities. He had worked in multiple uh, odd job situations. And consequently, he had grown much experienced about uh, you know the real street life of America and he uh, visualized what discrimination looked like. He started writing about these experiences and a very uh, popular character was created by him called Jesse B. Simple. Okay. He was called Simple and Simple was a poor man and black man and he was uh, always suffering in the hands of white people and he hated white people. There was a kind of mixed reaction to uh, the way in which Hughes wrote. Some people thought that he was showing the darker sides of uh, or the less glorious side of black people uh, and therefore they uh, thought that he wasn't doing any good service to the black community. But Langston Hughes felt that he had to be honest. He had to write not to impress others, but to bring out the truth about reality, about existence. So he did not compromise with truth. He did not falsely glorify a race. The plus side was that common people identified with characters like simple. And this identification led to a sense of communion, led to a sense of uh, fellow feeling where they could understand what Langston Hughes was writing. And this was the reason why Langston Hughes' popularity continued. He is like the unofficial poet laureate of the African Americans and he was a celebrated name of the Harlem Renaissance. And what is Harlem Renaissance? Normally, people had this kind of misconception that people belonging to countries like Africa or who had a colored origin, they lack intellectual fineness. So the writings and intellectual discussions of African Americans uh, were kind of considered to be uh, something not worth uh, talking about. Now, against this mindset, a movement started. And this movement uh, gained ground in different parts of New York and Harlem was the epicenter of this movement. It was the, the coffee house of Kolkata was the epicenter of Bengali intellectual movement. Just like that, Harlem was the epicenter of this black American movement where the focus was to develop and express the intellectual aspects of an African American. Langston Hughes actually writes a poem with the title Harlem, maybe someday we will discuss that, where he will talk about the way in which this intellectual movement is like an implosion. It's not explosion, implosion, it's imploding, which means it is exploding within itself. It's making one's own self awake. So it is an, a kind of awakening. So it is also called a renaissance. It's an alternative renaissance or renaissance for the black people. So this was happening in around 1920s. And this poem, which we are going to look at today, this was also written in 1920, although it was published one year later in 1921. So Langston Hughes was barely 20 years old and he was going to his father's house to stay with him for a year. He was on this train and the train was crossing a bridge over the river Mississippi. It's a very long river in America and it, it, it's a very uh, important river in America. So while he was crossing that river, he had certain thoughts in his mind and he wanted to write them down. So he just uh, took out a piece of paper which happened to be a letter from his father. And on the back side of that letter, he started writing this. So it was kind of a Wordsworthy and spontaneous overflow kind of a writing, you can say. Uh, and this poem eventually got published a year later in a journal called the crisis 
Now this crisis magazine, th uh, this is like uh, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. This was uh, formed by or rather this was founded by a person called uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. And to this man, W.E.B. Du Bois, Langston Hughes dedicated this poem a few years later. Okay, so this Du Bois personality, he was a very inspirational figure. He was a great intellectual man. Um, he was himself an activist, an educator, and he founded this uh, national association I talked about, and of course the Crisis uh, magazine. Hughes died on May 22nd, 1967. He was suffering from prostate cancer. So let's just look at the poem first at one go, then we will break it up into parts. The Negro speaks of rivers. I've known rivers. I have known rivers ancient as the world and older than the flow of human blood in human veins. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. I bathed in the Euphrates when the dawns were young. I built my hut near the Congo and it lulled me to sleep. I looked upon the Nile and raised the pyramids above it. I heard the singing of the Mississippi when Abe Lincoln went down to New Orleans and I've seen its muddy bosom turn all golden in the sunset. I've known rivers, ancient, dusky rivers. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. So the first thing we notice about this poem is an absolute absence of rhyme. Uh, the lines are not symmetrical, the lines are not similar or uh, of equal length. There is a lot of pause, there is no fixed set rhythm as well. But at the same time, it sounds musical. Now in Hugh's poetry, we have a lot of influence of gospels and uh, these folk music uh, which he uh, had access to. Uh, this kind of links him to his past or to his history, to his roots. Okay. So you can hear the drum beats in his poems. He, he, he popularized the beat poetry uh, and here in this poem, although you cannot actually uh, sing it out in, as a beat poem, but still there is a lot of beat which, which breaks the pattern and makes you stop uh, at some points. All right. Now let's first look at the lines and try to find out what meanings they convey. I have known rivers, I have known rivers ancient as the world and older than the flow of human blood in human veins. First line is very short, second line is very long, but they begin with the same three words I have known rivers. So we can say the second line is qualifying the first line. The first line appears to be a statement of which uh, an old man is uh, you know, telling his grandchildren about his life experience that see I have known about this world and then there is this qualification that I am as old as can be uh, and I have been there from the beginning of time. But then this qualifying statement when he is saying that I have known rivers ancient as the world. So he is talking about a knowledge which does not start with human civilization. It starts before human civilization begins. So his knowledge is derived from the knowledge of nature, not knowledge of human beings. And older than the flow of human blood in human veins. So Rivers have been there before human beings were there. We know that rivers are cradles of civilization. Cradles means the place where babies are kept and they grow up. Okay, the resting place you can say. So human civilizations started in and around great rivers. So knowledge of civilization comes with the knowledge of rivers that fed those civilizations. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. Rivers gain depth by their flow. Okay, The passage down towards the ocean 
So experience and history that deepens the soul of a river. So the more ancient a river is, the longer its line is, the deeper it becomes. He talks about the rivers about which he knows. I bathed in the Euphrates when dawns were young. I built my hut near the Congo and it lulled me to sleep. So first he mentions the name Euphrates. Euphrates was the river uh, in and around the Middle East area around which civilizations of the Sumerians, the Mesopotamians, those civilizations grew up. So Euphrates is considered to be the mother of a human civilization because these civilizations uh, were some of the oldest ones in the world. So when he is saying that I bathed in the Euphrates when dawns were young, he is talking about the dawning of human civilization, the beginning, the starting point, the point when everything was young. And when he is saying I, he is definitely not talking about himself, Langston Hughes. He is talking about human being as a collective I. So here, whenever he is using the uh, pronoun I, he is using it in the sense of a collective being, human beings as one. Okay. I bathed in the Euphrates when the dawns were young. So he's talking about historical moment long time back. I built my hut near the Congo and it lulled me to sleep. What's special about Congo? Congo is a river in uh, Africa and the original name of Congo was Zaire, Z-A-I-R-E, but he doesn't use that name. He uses the name Congo. It is uh, the world's deepest recorded river. He is deliberately using the word Congo because people who named it Congo were the colonizers who came to enslave the people of the Congo, to rule over them, to exploit the resources, to make the rich resourceful land a poor one. So when we look at the line, it becomes very interesting. He is saying, I built my hut near the Congo. It means that Congo was my cradle. Congo was my refuge. It gave me a place to build my hut. Hut means home where you stay. So he calls that place his home. And then he is saying, and it lulled me to sleep. And Congo gave, that river gave him a kind of assurance of safety that you can build your hut here but what happened this assurance failed people from Europe came and destroyed those happy people's lives so in a way we can say that Congo offered a place of shelter and then that place was taken away so Congo becomes not just a symbol of secure hut but also a symbol of despair where that security is taken away. And then he is talking about, I looked upon the Nile and raised the pyramids above it. Who built the pyramids? When you ask this question to even a person in uh, fifth or sixth grades, they would say the Egyptians built the pyramids. The Pharaoh built the pyramid, the king of Egyptians. Uh, those kings, they built the pyramids. What we don't realize is that pyramids were not built by kings with their own hands or with their bare hands. They were built by the slaves, the Jewish slaves, the African slaves who carried these boulders on their shoulders and created these wonders of the world. So when uh, he is saying that I built the pyramids, he is using the word I raised the pyramids as if pyramids were built like uh, on a magic spell, raising it. And that feeling of 
ownership. I erased the pyramid. That feeling was not given to the slaves who were building the pyramids. They never felt like I am doing something. It was not seen as their achievement. But Langston Hughes is saying that I feel that that is my achievement. That is the achievement of my race. The race that was enslaved. And then finally, I heard the singing of the Mississippi. Where is Mississippi? Mississippi is in America. When Abe Lincoln went down to New Orleans. Now this is an incident which he talks about uh, in context of this poem. Langston Hughes said that he remembered about an incident where Abraham Lincoln, he was very young, he was 19 years and he went on this boat uh, trip to flat boat trip to uh, down the Mississippi River and he went to a place and saw that people were bought and sold as commodities. He felt shocked and that shocking memory stayed with him and it had such an effect on him that Abraham Lincoln uh, eventually became the person to abolish this whole idea of enslavement. The 13th Amendment, the abolition of slavery, uh, that was passed in the year 1865, it was December. Three fourths of the 36 states uh, voted in favor of ratification, that is this correction. The state of Mississippi did not give a positive vote. But since the majority uh, vote was obtained, uh, this amendment was passed. Interestingly, some researchers started uh, digging a bit about uh, what happened after this amendment was passed. Now, all those states who had not voted in favor of this act, they had eventually accepted and placed those, their documentations and agreements and everything. But it was seen that there was this oversight and Mississippi state had not placed its documentation, which meant that uh, even in 2013, the slave law was not abolished legally in Mississippi state. Of course, it was not practiced, but technically it was not abolished. Just imagine, 2013, almost 100 years after this poem is written. And these researchers, they got this idea from a movie called Lincoln. Okay, so this is even more pathetic. Anyways, the authorities came to their senses, they saw their mistake, uh, their clerical uh, oversight, and they corrected it and this uh, whole problem was solved and the 13th amendment was passed in the state of Mississippi in February 2013. Why is Mississippi so important? Now, from Minnesota to Louisiana, this is a long river, it's like more than 2000 miles long and it has a lot of history and this history is intimately connected with commerce. Before the setting of the railroads, Mississippi was the connector, okay, and it was the primary trade route before the establishment of the railroads. And it mostly transported cash crops and slaves. Cotton was uh, one of the most important cash crops that was uh, being produced here. So in a way, Mississippi River represents uh, the oppression, the state of enslavement. But in this line, he is not talking about uh, an oppressive state of Mississippi. He is talking about the moment when Abraham Lincoln was witnessing that trading of slaves. And that moment was very important because that moment led to the final emancipation. Because Abraham Lincoln saw those people and felt bad. That's why he did so much to make things better. So Mississippi River becomes not just a symbol of despair, 
but a symbol of hope. So we have this expression, the singing of the Mississippi. Songs are vital to black Americans. Their existence uh, it resonates with rhythm of the jazz and, and folk songs. Okay. So when he is talking about sinking of the Mississippi, he means the hopeful voices of the black people in and around those places. And Mississippi was also a river which helped the slaves escape. So Mississippi carried them to the places where they were kept as slaves and Mississippi helped them escape. Then he is saying, I have seen its muddy bosom. The river's bed is muddy and it is somehow linked with the dark skin of the black people. It is muddy when it is not giving any hope, but it turns golden in sunlight or rather during the sunset. So Abe Lincoln's visit becomes a moment of hope. But then this is sunset and sunset is not something which offers permanent light. It carries with it the threat of darkness. So is he trying to say that the transformation of the river from muddy to golden is beautiful. So the freeing of slave people through that act of emancipation is beautiful. But is it lasting? Is it permanent? Will it hold the test of time? So a 20 year old Langston Hughes talks about a 19 year old Abraham Lincoln looking at the river Mississippi. He is also looking at the river Mississippi. So he is trying to see if he can also find some golden light there. Because all around him during 1920s, he is seeing a lot of racial discrimination. Think about this year, 1920. The world had broken up into pieces. The world war had just ended. And the hardest hit countries try to regain their richness, prosperity at the cost of their colonies. And therefore, places like India, Africa, these places suffered immensely. Eventually, he charts the journey of African American uh, people, dawn to sunset. We have this line, like a cycle of life, the cycle of civilization, you have the word dawn and then you have the word sunset. It's as if the journey of human beings is equated with the journey of the rivers. So while these rivers on one hand represent prosperity, richness, security, affluence, on the other hand these very rivers talk about unspoken violence, unspoken discrimination. This is historian uh, called Dr. Don Hernandez. He, he, he said something very beautiful that Mississippi represents not bondage but opportunity. And he actually said these words, I'm quoting him. History reports that people who were enslaved and who were working in this area from time to time sought freedom by escaping across the Mississippi River. This is what I was telling you, that river provides the opportunity to escape the trouble, to escape the suffering which is caused by the river. So finally, when he ends the poem, I have known rivers. He is not just talking about knowing the names of the rivers. He is talking about knowing the history associated with rivers. So this knowledge is not a personal knowledge about the geographical situation, but a generational knowledge, wisdom about the history of civilization. Ancient dusky rivers. Just now he was talking about sunset and now he's talking about dusky rivers. Rivers during the dusk when the twilight is fading off, light is diminished. 
So he's saying that the golden glow is often gone. So the story of a river is story of turning from darkness to dawn, from dawn to sunset and then from sunset to dusk. And he feels that there was discrimination, there was escape. There is discrimination. So yes, we can hope for an eventual escape. He didn't know that 100 years after he writes this, we will have hashtag Black Lives Matter still trending because we will have to be reminded that Black Lives Matter. We are so dumb insensitive. He ends the poem with the words, my soul has grown deep like the rivers. The word soul sounds very much like soil. The soul is connected with the soil the soil is connected with the soul. So this I, this me is a person who belongs to a civilization where human beings are connected to nature. So there is a lot of, uh, you can say Walt Whitmanish feeling here. A lot of, uh, you can say even romantic temperament here. But this romanticism is not uh, technically an escape. This is an embracing of reality. So within this consciousness, Euphrates, Congo, Nile, Mississippi, all become one. They are not separate rivers. They represent a continuity, a kind of uh, collective consciousness. So we have two aspects in this poem. Primary one is uh, the slave trade that cut off the black people from their homes, from their original places. So this trade broke the continuity in their lives in a way. So in order to gain back the strength of their community, this continuity has to be re-established. How do you re-establish continuity? By talking about your history. You get disconnected from your home, not when you are actually taken away from that place, but when you stop talking about that place. If you are from in and around uh, places like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, you know that we have been through this common suffering of the partition. If you are from Bangladesh, uh, you would know that there was basically no uh, difference so far as a person of West Bengal and a person of Bangladesh was concerned so far as the roots were concerned. The partition brought a line in between, but it has not taken away that connection. Why? Because there had been so much of writings in partition literature. So partition literature helps us remain connected. And this is what Langston Hughes is talking about. That we will go back to our roots. We can establish or re-establish that connection if we talk about our homes. Okay. The second aspect uh, which I found very important here is that history has always focused on white people. There is nothing called history. History is something which is narrated by someone. So whoever is writing history, that person looks at history through his own eyes. So I prefer to use the word historiography instead of saying history. Historiography means writing of history. Whoever writes history, writes it in or from his own perspective. If you look at the title, what does it say? The Negro speaks of rivers. If I ask you, what are the key words in the title? You would tell me, ma'am, the two key words are Negro and rivers. And you will explain what a Negro means here, what rivers mean here. But I will tell you that the most important key word in this title is speaks. The concept of voice, a black man, talking about his history, 
he is claiming back his identity or he's claiming back his right to talk about himself. So when he says the Negro speaks of rivers, he's using the article the. He's not saying a Negro. It's not a, it's, it's not a random Negro anywhere. He's saying the Negro. And why is he using the word Negro here? He's not using this as a derogatory term at all. In 1920s, Negro was a, a name associated with a lot of racial pride. Black people, they call themselves Negro, trying to establish the uniqueness of their identities. It has now become a bad word, that's a different thing. But when a black man is calling himself a Negro, he's definitely not uh, abusing himself verbally. But he's using the article the. So this is the collective Negro race speaking for the first time because voice is something that was not allowed to the enslaved people and he's talking about what he's talking about reverse something which makes him remember his roots the ancient civilizations because that history will keep him feel the pride that he has continued Black Americans are extremely uh, robust races. They show a lot of perseverance. You know what perseverance is, means no matter what they fight on. And this poem is about perseverance. This poem is about continuity. And this title tells us how Langston Hughes is talking about history as something that has to be rewritten. How? By speaking in the voice of the oppressed. The form is, uh, of course, uh, free verse. If you are trying to free yourself, the first thing you should break away from is the meter and rhyme and rhythm of the Europeans. So we don't have any iambic pentameter here. We do not have even alliteration here. What we do have is a lot of assonance and consonants. Consonants is where you have uh, same consonant ending words uh, in the same sentence. There's a lot of beat uh, in many of Langston Hill's poem. You can actually uh, recite it with some drums going on in beats. And even like in this poem, if you just read uh, a couple of lines, you can have a sense of that rhythm. For instance, I bathed in the Euphrates when the dawns were young. I built my hut in the Congo and it lulled me to sleep. So you see, you can kind of speak in beats. And then it ends like this. I've known rivers, ancient dusky rivers. So there is this kind of an enthusiastic beat. And a kind of rage imploding inside. That I have known what I am. And I now have to speak about it. I often speak about enjambment in many of uh, poems, especially in context of American poetry. Enjambment is where you don't end at the end of a line and just carry on to the next part of the line or the next line. So when you read this poem, your eye literally goes in a zigzag motion and not regular zigzag motion. You, you don't know when you're going long and when you're going short. So if you think about the movement of your eyes when you read this poem, you will feel that your eyes go like the river in a zigzag fashion, irregular zigzag fashion. Form becomes the theme here. So the form of this poem with its cyclical pattern, its refrains, repetition of lines, I've known rivers a lot of times. This establishes the uniqueness the cultural identity and the need to rewrite history. Just think about the fact that this was being written by a boy who was as old as you are. He was like 20. He was fighting with his father because he wanted to be a writer. And he, at that point, didn't know how important his words are going to be. 
at that moment he just felt that connection looking at the mississippi river connection with abe lincoln the 20 year old abe lincoln and then the connection with the people enslaved trying to escape and out of that connection he felt this universality so i hope you have understood the significance of the symbols rivers as symbols darkness as symbol if you have any problem understanding any phrase or wish to ask any question about anything related to this poem please feel free to do so in the comment section i hope you have enjoyed today's class and i hope to see you all in my next video very soon this is monami mukherjee signing off till our next video stay happy stay subscribed <laughs>